When you get a phone call as an associate pastor at 6.30 in the morning on a Sunday, it means one of two things. It means the pastor's come in and found you've done something wrong and wants to tell you about it. <laughs> or it means the senior pastor is sick. Since Tim's not here, I guess it means the latter. <laughs> Tim is sick. Tim has a kidney infection, kidney stone. He's in a lot of pain. Those of you that know Tim know that he would be here if he could physically get up onto the stage and he'd speak, but he's in a lot of pain. So anyway, keep him in your prayers this morning. Uh, so he's not here this morning. I got to practice at the 8 o'clock service, so you're not the first service <laughs> that I did. But we're relying on the Holy Spirit a lot this morning. So anyway, let's watch the video announcements. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad that you joined us this morning. If you're new to our church, please feel free to fill out a Connect card in front of you and put it in the offering. And this gives us your contact information so that we can contact you with information about what happens around our church, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week as well. These Connect cards are also for our whole church family. If you have prayer requests, please fill them out and we meet every Tuesday to pray over your needs. Thank you for being here this morning. Shelly, Shelly, I think he's ready. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Tim and I were in a little bit of a war of a painting contest. Seniors Luncheon is coming up October 9th, so we really hope you can be there and join us. And it's going to be a catered lunch this month, so all you have to do is bring your $5. There'll be plenty of food and wonderful desserts. So let's see how your pastor and I have done in our painting competition. Hang on, I'm trying to get ready. Okay, ready? Five dollars. Practical. Pra creative. Hope you join us. Hi, I'm Corey Gallardo. I'm the hostess of the New Hope Women's Facebook page. If you are interested in joining our Facebook page, send a request, a friend request to Fawn Boss, and you can join us. And I post weekly and welcome comments. It's designed for busy women who maybe can't find the time or don't have the, a way to join the other small groups or women's events so we can find community online. Hope to meet you there. It's Christmas time, and I'd like to invite you to sign up for the Christmas Choir. Uh, if you can carry a tune, we'd like to have you. Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Uh, and even if you can't carry a tune, we'll help you carry it. Uh, rehearsals are Wednesday evenings at 6.30. We'd love to have you there. If you're looking for a way to volunteer at New Hope, we have some immediate needs. As well, you can visit our Ministries page and click on Serving Opportunities. There, you'll find many others to choose from. It's that time to show our pastors a little bit of appreciation. Join us on October 7th for Pastors Appreciation Day during the 9, 15, and 11 a.m. service. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with sermons, announcements, and more. Okay, so a few other announcements. But firstly, there's a clipboard going around, and I just want to tell you what's on the clipboard. Um, I'm going to have to read this because I was playing catch-up this morning on this. But the Fresno Rescue Mission uh, needs baked goods. So if you want to bake some baked goods and put them in, uh, on a table, that'll be here uh, October 14th. That event is on the 16th. It's a fundraiser for the Fresno Rescue Mission. Uh, I think we did it last year. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, three years. Okay. Short memory. My, my memory's great, it's just short. So, um, the, so if you want to do that, sign up for that on this uh, yellow sheet. And then also there's the Christmas choir. If you want to be part of that, sign up on here. Um, and then the third one is the seniors lunch, which we don't need this on here. So the seniors lunch, sign up for that because it is a uh, catered event so that we know how many people we need to plan for on that. So those will be going around this morning. Uh, other announcements, we have uh, the Neonan students. So there's the board there with the Neonan students, Ivory Coast, 585 a year for the uh, sponsorship of these kids. It pr pretty much provides everything for them and their education uh, at the village of Neonan. Um, we've been doing this for years and it's uh, really paid off 
uh, in so many ways, just to, when you go see the kids and just see the, the success that they're having because of the support from this church, uh, it's huge. So I think there's 11 left. I think there might be 10 now, but there was 11 left this morning. So if you're interested in sponsoring, uh, that window is closing quickly. Um, so get over there, write your name on the, the blank space underneath the name of the student. Uh, the Prison Fellowship No More Blues Closet is uh, collecting clothes outside. This was sort of previously announced, so if you have clothes for that, then in the pavilion there's a table, and Gloria is out there. She'd be happy to take those off your hands. Um, harvest Evening Service. Next weekend, in the evening, we have a 5 p.m. evening service, and this is kind of celebrate of the harvest time. Something that we've been doing over the last year is the evening service at 5 p.m. We are no longer doing that on a every week basis. We'll be doing it on a once a month basis. First Sunday of every month will be the evening service, and it'll have a theme based around whatever season we happen to be in. Obviously, this one is for harvest. You know, in, in November, it'll be giving thanks. December, the Advent season, uh, and the sermon and the worship will be based around that particular season. Um, we encourage kids to come into the sanctuary. We have toddler and uh, baby care if you need that, so, uh, but elementary school upwards, we encourage kids to be in here, take communion with family, um, and then worship and hear the message. It'll all be geared towards family or everybody from elementary school all the way up. Um, so come to that 5 p.m. here in the sanctuary next Sunday evening, and then it'll be ongoing for uh, the first Sunday of the month. Um, ch children's play. Christmas children's play. Every year we have a Christmas children's play uh, just before the Christmas time, and it's uh, it usually in the evening. We are doing rehears starting rehearsals for that in two weeks' time on the 14th. The kids rehearse and during third service at 11 o'clock in the office. Um, so if you have kids, grandkids that want to participate in the play, uh, it's always a fight every year for the lead parts, and so it's really funny. We have a group of sixth grade girls right now that all want the lead parts, so... Last year we had to split parts to, so that everyone could have, have something, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Kids really enjoy it. They get to sing. They'll sing that morning before the performance uh, in the sanctuary during the Sunday morning service. Um, it's great to invite uh, grandparents, friends to come. Um, I get to build a set, which I'm really excited about because I don't get to do it for VBS anymore. So uh, it'll be a theme this year. Is the, it's like a Christian version of the Polar Express. So, very, very, it's a very good play. Music is great. So, if your kids, grandkids want to participate in that, you can sign up in the kids' center or just turn up in two weeks' time on the 14th, a third service in the office. Um, I think that is, or oh, the senior lunch we mentioned on the video, so the sign up's going around for that. That should be fun. Um, prayer requests. We have a prayer request this morning for an organization called Champions for Tomorrow. Um, they sort of interact with kids, ex-athletes that uh, have a story to tell and a story that will really impact kids. Got a, different schools around the area. They come into different areas, go different schools. So we pray for them as they reach out to many, many kids in this area over a three-day period. Um, how many schools they go? They're going to 15 schools, 30,000 kids 50. to be touched here in the Fresno area, the inner city schools, over the next three days. So right. 15 schools, 30,000 kids will be, you know, this is a great way to spread the message of Jesus in schools uh, in a fairly low impact way without getting hauled in by the authorities. So, um, so this, is, this is great. Uh, so pray for them over the next three days. Um, also, you know, it, it's funny, on Friday morning I was thinking to myself, I was frustrated Friday morning. I didn't say this in the 8 o'clock service, but I thought to myself Friday, it's lucky I don't have a pulpit this weekend because I'm frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> well, God does funny things. So I was frustrated because I was on Facebook, which, you know, we all go on Facebook, and it's frustrating just reading all the stuff on Facebook over this last few days, especially. And I think to myself, I don't care which side of the fence you're on for any of the political stuff, that doesn't matter. And I think to myself, what have we forgotten? We've forgotten two basic laws that God gave us. Love God and love your neighbor. And some of the hatred on Facebook. So some people may have the love God thing down, but some of the hatred that you see on Facebook from all sides is just, that is not loving your neighbor. It was 
I think vile is the only word that I can use to describe it. So I think today we should pray that we can get back to these two basic laws. Love God, love your neighbor. And actually my sermon has a part of it this morning. It's kind of interesting. So um, anyway, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward uh, as we pray for loving our neighbors. And we'll pray for some of the families that have had services this week. Susan Boyd's service was here yesterday um, from outside of the church, but uh, great family. Stan King's service was this week, Judy Passini's family. Um, so we'll pray for them too. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask you to help refocus our lives. It's easy to get lost in this culture, lost in the sort of barrage of information that comes our way. We get lost in, um, or we get wrapped up in this momentum of other people's thoughts and opinions. And Lord, it's easy just to jump on the bandwagon. So we, Lord, we just pray for wisdom. We pray for insight. And we pray for grounding to bring us back to the basics. The message that Jesus gave us to love you and to love our neighbor. It's the two most fundamental things that we can learn in church. It's the two most fundamental things that we can do in life. So Lord, we just pray for a reset. Consideration of what we're saying when we put it out there in a public forum. And Lord, we thank you for the guidelines that Jesus gave us. We thank you for the clarity that he spoke with so many times and we just pray that we will embrace that instead of forgetting about it between Sundays. Lord, we pray for the families that had services this week, either off campus with Tim doing them or here on campus. Lord, we just pray for uh, your strength in them as they deal with the loss of loved ones. Lord, we pray for all those prayer requests that are unsaid right now but are in people's minds. You know what they are, Lord, and we just pray that you, will, that you will take heed and that people will reach out to you and reach, reach out in such a way that they look to you for guidance rather than pushing you away in times of difficulty. Lord, we pray for the champions of tomorrow as they reach so many children's ears with a message that is clear and, and full of hope. And Lord, we just pray for children that really need to hear this message right now. Some go to school and it's their only refuge. So Lord, we just pray that they will hear that there is refuge in you every single hour of every single day. Lord, we pray for all this and more. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if we were to do like a reset, start from scratch, say, what is it that Christ is trying to say to us? Because if we were to get back down to grassroots, we talked about that, you know, <clears throat> love the Lord our God, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. But where in the Bible can we get to some really basic instructions that Jesus wants to give us? And that's the Sermon on the Mount. For those of you that were coming to Sunday evening, fortunately few of you, <laughs> fortunately this morning, <laughs> I did a series on Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to revisit some of that. So if you've heard it before, I'm sorry, but it probably doesn't hurt to hear it again. So the Sermon on the Mount was covered over three chapters in Matthew. There's a lot of red writing in 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew because Jesus spoke a lot. He had a lot to say. But before that, Jesus had called his disciples. He'd gone off and done some healings. He'd done some preaching to a lesser extent around. So he had kind of gaining a reputation at that point already. So by the time he got to the area where he gave the Sermon on the Mount, people were pretty familiar with who he was. But the Sermon on the Mount has some sort of strangely universal ability to invade and affect our soul if we listen to what it has to say. Jesus' message is very direct in this particular part of his teachings. Towards the end, 
In Matthew 7, he says, do unto others as you would have done to yourself. It's pretty clear. There's a lot of imagery and sort of relatable pictures that Jesus paints. Towards the end, again, he talks about building a house on the rock instead of the sand. So when the storms come, you can withstand the storms. Building your life on the foundation of Christ instead of something a lot less stable. But he also has a message of hope and comfort. And that's in chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The verbal impact of what Jesus says should linger in our heart and our mind. As a background, the Sermon on the Mount was preached in the mountains above the Sea of Galilee. And this was kind of an area that was well known for revolutionaries to go. Up in the mountains there, there was access to it. It was close enough to places where people could come. So revolutionaries had followers that would come out. They could hear what they had to say. But they were far enough away from authorities that they didn't bother them. They were not going to go out into these mountains and mess with these people because it was just not worth the trouble. So a revolutionary area. So it's some irony that the Sermon on the Mount was preached there. Although at the time it was considered by many to be completely revolutionary. So it's a not so subtle inference that Jesus was in fact a revolutionary. And he was. What he said and what he did during his lifetime revolutionized the world. It has not been the same since. Before Christ was different than after. So Matthew starts this section with the phrase, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So this is in chapter 5 of Matthew. It gives an image of Jesus settling into the mountainside to teach his disciples. And he sits. It says that he sits. Well, this implies he really was just going to teach his disciples, a small group, the original small group. Sit in the mountainside, I'm going to teach my disciples what they need to know because they are going to then teach others what they need to know and they're going to disciple and that's how it works. But there was a great crowd that gathered. He didn't stand anymore. He just, I mean, if I was going to preach, well, I'm preaching today, but I wouldn't sit there and preach if, unless I wanted to preach just to the front row or the front people. So I'm standing. So there's no implication that Jesus was about to preach this great sermon to a multitude of people. He was teaching and everybody else was eavesdropping. That's bottom line. Right? But it's good because they heard the great message that Jesus had to say. In this sermon, Jesus provides us with an insight and a glimpse into what God, godly living truly looks like. He invites us to join him in living it out. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteousness will live by faith, or the righteous will live by faith. The core of what Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is really quite simple. It's not a very complicated section of the Bible. You don't have to sit there and overanalyze what Jesus is saying. It's pretty clear. In the same way that James was really clear about what he wanted to say, but the hard part about this is following what it says. That's the challenge. The challenge is not understanding it. The challenge is following it. But the idea of what the words of Jesus would have, should have as a serious influence on our lives is first that they should the words should become a sword to a heart of our own complacency. And a sword is used in many ways in the Bible to, to describe the word of God because it penetrates deep inside. So the, the sword should be penetrating the heart of our own complacency. Why should it be penetrating complacency? Because it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to become satisfied with our own lives and just get in a rut without trying to improve anything or change anything. The second thing is that this sermon should be a scalpel that exposes our own hypocrisy. So we go from a sword, the much broader image, to a scalpel, where we're really fine-tuning 
what we have inside. The scalpel should be tearing out or cutting out the hypocrisy of our lives. We should be looking at our own lives before we look at those of others and criticize. And Jesus has said this in many different ways. It should also be the light that shines on the darkest parts of our lives. Not necessarily a big floodlight or a huge light, but a, a laser that focuses in on the things in our deepest insides that we don't want to show anybody else. We're ashamed of. Because that's what resides in the dark. We don't put things in the light that we're proud of. Or we do put things in the light that we're proud of. We don't put things in the dark that we're proud of. It's the dark that hides the secrets. So the laser can seek out the very depths and expose our weaknesses that can be improved with Jesus' words. Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount as kind of the Christian value system. The original CVS. It's like medication for the soul. I mean, you go to CVS, get medication, right? The prescription, ethical standards, spiritual devotion and what that should look like. He talks about our attitude to money, our attitude towards ambition, to our lifestyle, to our relationships, even the relationships that seem at odds with our Christian walk. Pastor Darren Spoo said that the Jesus' message was a simple but significant challenge to continue to become until you become completely like him. The sculptor Michelangelo had a very definitive approach to the way that he sculpted his pieces of art. Whenever he had a new piece of stone brought into his studio, he would just have it sitting in the middle of the room and he would live life around it for a little bit. He would eat, he would sleep next to it, he would walk around it, he would inspect it. He'd spend a lot of time just trying to get to know the piece of stone. In the early morning, the angle of the sun was just right, that it would come through his window, it would hit the stone, and for a moment, he could see through the translucent marble, and he could see the veins and the flaws that are inside it. So he got to know this piece of marble very well, inside and out, the contours, the composition. And it was only after completely understanding the stone's strengths and weaknesses that he would pick up a hammer and chisel and begin to work on the sculpture. Because if you don't know where the weaknesses are in a piece of stone, you can easily break it in the wrong place. So in the same way that Michelangelo does that, Jesus works on our gifts. But he also works on our flaws and our personalities. He can see what we're weak at. And he'll make the most of it. In the same way that Michelangelo does that and sees the transparency of the stone, Jesus always sees inside us. We are always transparent to the ever-seeing but ever-loving eyes of Jesus. And every artist patiently shapes their piece of art, and so we become more and more like him. Can anyone else hear piano music? That's just me. <laughs> I thought it was just an inner monologue gone wrong. <laughs> so. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is an important part of how he shapes and molds us. It's kind of the handbook for kingdom culture. And this is a life in the kingdom of God, a fully human life, but under the divine rule of God. So the part we look at today is a bulk of chapter 5, although it's not a bulk of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes is, is Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12, and it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will show mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, who people, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the word beatitude basically means supreme blessedness. So there's a series of short messages from God, through Jesus, through the mouth of Jesus, to grasp for a minute Onto the last part of that word, beatitude, 
is attitude. And that's really what it's about. It's about our attitude. And Jesus is saying, our attitude is very important. Attitude can often come from how we explain circumstances that we're in to ourselves. That's basically what attitude is. If we're in a certain circumstances, how we explain it to ourselves is, is the attitude that we take on. It doesn't matter if somebody else explains our situation to us, and often they do want to do that. It's how we see it ourselves that's important, and that's what dictates our attitude. Good and bad things happen to us all. No one is exempt. But a good and bad, but how it originates, doesn't matter. It's how we explain these circumstances to ourselves. And the core message is that when life seems unfair, when it isn't what we perceive it to be great, and that will happen a lot more often than we want to, we have to remember one simple fact, that God is good. Always. So when we look at these Beatitudes, we can see that there's some qualities that we consider to be strengths. Verse 7, being merciful. Verse 8, having a pure heart. Verse 9, being a peacemaker. These are all great things. We want these in our arsenal. We want to be like this. But then there's others. If you read other parts of it, it sound like weaknesses, poverty, mourning, persecution. We don't want that. Why would we? It doesn't sound good. But Jesus is powerful. Remember that. And Jesus is very creative. So when he's saying all these things, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're weaknesses. And we'll get into that. God never wastes an opportunity. When Jonah was running from God, God pursued him. Didn't waste an opportunity when it came to the people in the boat with him. He wanted them to throw him over, but he showed them his greatness in that particular story. So we need to remember that God never misses an opportunity in our lives, even in our greatest weaknesses, to mold us into what he wants us to be. So let's look at a little more detail in these short verses and see exactly what they're saying. The first is, blessed in the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. Well, again, that doesn't sound very good. Poor in spirit. That sounds like we're not very good Christians. We don't want to be poor in spirit. And why do they get the kingdom of heaven? That doesn't make any sense. So you can see people would get upset. First one, right out of the gate. Jesus is saying something that people are like, what do you mean? That doesn't make sense. But this is to do with spiritual destitution. It's a slightly different thing, and I'll explain that. If we take a quick look back at Luke, or forward at Luke, I should say. Not <laughs> forward at Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. The story there is two men went to a temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, and he said, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I have. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So in this story, we see a picture of someone that is considered to be universally spiritually rich. The Pharisee. Those were the people that everyone looked up to and said, these are spiritually rich people. They do what is correct. They check the boxes of religion. So what does it con considered to be spiritually poor. Well, the tax collector is the picture of the spiritually poor. But the reality is that the Pharisee is the one that's foolish. He looks down on the others and holds himself up higher than everybody else. I'm glad I'm not like those other people, he said. He needs only his own approval. He is spiritually wealthy. But then the tax collector approaches God. He can barely look up to heaven. He has humility. He understands his weaknesses. He knows he's a sinner, and he asks God to forgive him. Have mercy on me. So the tax collector has an honest view of himself. And his spiritual condition simply declares spiritual bankruptcy. And at this point, at spiritual bankruptcy, all you can do is to trust outside of yourself because you have no resources left. You need to put your trust in the hands of God. When you're bankrupt, you have nothing left. All you can do 
is build from that. And God will help you. And this is what Jesus wants from us. So when we're spiritually destitute, we're forced to move beyond ourselves, rely on God, and we become rich beyond this life. So what appears to be negative at first is when Jesus says the poor in spirit becomes a positive. We want to be poor in spirit because it means we've handed everything over to God. We don't rely on ourselves. We don't have our own sort of standard. It's God's standard. So this is where the countercultural side of Jesus comes in. He's sort of turning on its head the common teaching of that time, the Pharisees. So the second one says, blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. And you're like, mourning, that's not good. I mean, this morning is nice, but mourning itself is not generally considered to be good. But think about this, are you tired? Are you tired not just of the sins that we commit? We get tired of that, we say we can't believe we keep doing this. Because the fact is, we get tired of the sins we commit, but we also get tired of doing it over and over again. And we just don't seem to be able to figure out how to stop. Do we mourn over the fact that our desire to be good does not always come out the way we want it to be? Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Second Corinthians 7, Paul writes, For godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance is the act of sincerely regretting the sin of our past. And that bit's important. With a goal to never doing it again. So it's twofold. We regret what we've done in the past. We're repenting because we expect to never have to do it again. But we do it. So when we repent, we make a decision to turn away from evil and serve God. Repentance is a requirement for the forgiveness of sins. It's part of when you accept Christ. Part of that is you repent. You accept that you're a sinner and you repent. It's one of those steps. It's a very critical part of what we believe in. So when godly sorrow comes, we see ourselves in a light of the word of God and see how far we short in relation to it. And that's when we mourn. We fall short of God's divine nature, God's desire. And we mourn that. We'll, it'll drive us to work on our own salvation. In this case, mourning is good because it drives us to do something. It, it drives us to work on our salvation and to cleanse ourselves. And our nature becomes more and more like God's nature as we work on this. This is why it's written in Ecclesiastes 7.2, better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. It's better to mourn our sin than it is to celebrate our sin, for sure. So in this context, we see that mourning is being brokenhearted over our sin, over our amazing ability to fall short of God's expectations every day. But we do find comfort through God and through His mercy and forgiveness. The next one, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Well, it's not getting any better. The meek. Who likes to be called meek? Sounds very weak. Weak is meek. Sorry. <laughs> Off at a tangent there. <laughs> a Seuss moment. Word, the word that conjures up from meekness is weakness, and it's, most people don't want to be called that, so... You can see, you know, Jesus is layering it here. He's sort of starting off with this one weakness of saying, those people are going to inherit the, um, you know, the earth, and these people um, who are mourning are also going to get what they're, they're going to get comfort, which is good. But now if you're meek, you will inherit the earth or the land. I mean, this is huge. If you're meek, and the earth and the land, same word in, in Greek, so... You know, do you really want to be a meek person? Well, we can look to Psalms 37 for inspiration on whether we want to be meek. Psalm 37, 11 says, But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Well, there you go. There's a throwback to Psalm 37. So Jesus says, the meek will inherit the earth. Well, David said this. Also in this psalm, in verse 9, the second part, it says, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So the meek will inherit the earth, 
Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. The earth and the land are the same word in Greek. So based on this psalm, David is saying that those who hope or wait in the Lord will inherit the land and conclude that the meek have hope. So following that line of thought, then David very kindly gives us a breakdown of what it means to be meek from verses 5 to 8. So he ends up with that particular expression. But now he's going to tell us, what is it to be meek? Well, who are these people? What characteristics do they have? It says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. So the first thing that we get a picture of here is that the meek trust in God. Biblical meekness is rooted in the deep confidence that God is for us and God is not against us. They also commit their way to God. They commit their businesses, their problems, their relationships, their health, their fears, their frustrations, and they admit that they are completely insufficient to cope. There are so many complexities and pressures in life. There are obstacles that we have to get over, but we need to trust God. The meek trust God because He is able and willing to sustain them and guide them and protect them. The third thing is they are quiet before God and they wait for him. They're quiet and they wait for him. They first of all discover God can be trusted in the first thing. We, they can trust God to take everything. And second, they commit their way. And now they wait patiently in the stillness and they, and they work, wait for God to work in his own way. Not lazy, but just free to wait. Having a steady calm that comes from knowing that God's in control even when the storms are raging around you. They don't fret over the wicked. That's the last part that, that David talks about. They don't fret over the wicked. They don't fret over themselves because of what wicked people are doing. Wicked people frost, prosper all the time. We see that. We shouldn't fret about it. Their family, their work, their life is in God's sovereign hands. They trust Him. They wait patiently and quietly to see how God works out his power and goodness in their lives. And all the setbacks and obstacles do not produce the kind of bitterness and anger and fretfulness that is so common in man. Moses was referred to as meek. But it was almost used like an insult. So this may be one of the reasons meek isn't one of the best words that we like. Miriam and Aaron called him meek, but not as a good expression. But in the verses that follow that, God immediately rebuked them. And he vindicated Moses in that particular characteristic. So God does not see it as weak. Biblical meekness is a huge subject. And we could have a whole sermon about that. But chapters 1 and 3 of James are worth looking at if you're interested in it. James talks a lot about the meek and about biblical meekness. So if we move on to blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. The fact is that all of us as people have a desire within us. It's built in. God gave us a desire inside us. It's a feeling of restlessness. Everybody's felt it at some point. You get a feeling of restlessness. And what do we do with that? We feed it with all kinds of things. We hunger and thirst for worldly things, whether it's acceptance, accolades, money, alcohol, drugs, sex, or the latest cars and boats. But all this stuff just turns to ashes. The real craving in a man's heart is God. God gave us so many blessings, yet we still feel this longing. And it's designed to help us want to seek the face of God not everything else in the world. St. Augustine said, Thou madest us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. So God made us for him. He gave us that natural craving to seek him, but we seek everything else except him. Isaiah 55 says, We spend money on what is not bread, and you'll, you labor on what does not satisfy Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 
talks about chasing the wind, about looking for satisfaction in worldly desires and not finding it. Well, sometimes we do find it, but it's brief. And what it does then is it just leaves us wanting more and more, and we're never satisfied. I'm going to read a section from Ecclesiastes 2. It's kind of long, but it really paints the picture of what we seem to do as people. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers in a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all of my toil. Yet, small word, big meaning, yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. The chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So Jesus is saying that if we hunger for the thirst of righteousness, if we crave the will of God, the lifestyle that's fitting for the kingdom of God, we will find long-lasting satisfaction. It will not be fleeting. Our thirst will be clenched, quenched, our hunger will be satisfied, but that is the only thing that will fulfill that longing, and that's God. So then we go to blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We're going to mold these together with the other two as well, the next two. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So we've got the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. These three together kind of paint a picture for what it is that we were craven hungering for in the, first, in the previous one. What is a righteous life? What is it that we, crave, we should be craving and hungering? That we are pure in heart, that we show mercy to others, and that we are peacemakers in the world. This is how righteousness manifests itself in those who have been hungering for it. But what is mercy? What does that look like? Matthew 9 kind of spells it out when it says Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, not the sinners. There's something in this passage that always strikes me, and that is the fact that they're called tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors seem to have the whole category of their own. It's not, it doesn't just say he went and ate with sinners. Tax collectors were so revered, by, or not revered, but reviled, I guess is the, the opposite, but they just, they had a whole category of their own. It was always tax collectors and sinners. It wasn't just sinners. Anyway, uh, Jesus says that it's the sick who needs a doctor. He likens himself to a doctor who needs to go to the sinners. You don't generally go to a doctor when you're feeling good. You're feeling fine. Tim always tells the story of, you know, no one ever goes to a pastor when everything's just going great. In the same way, Jesus goes to those that are sick as a doctor to help them. This comes back to the CVS thing, the medication. Luke 10, a man asks Jesus how a person should act when they want to find mercy at the day of judgment and inherit eternal life. And Jesus answers that the people who receive the mercy of eternal life are those who have loved God with all their hearts and their neighbor, and their neighbor as themselves. Those two fundamental rules, the two laws that we should follow no matter what, love God, love your neighbor. There's a church in Camarillo that I heard about. I saw a picture of it, but it's the whole of the wall on the back. It's just wood, plain wood. There's a plain cross in the middle. And on one side it's written, love God. On the other side, love your neighbors. That's it. That's all they have on the stage. But it's very effective. It's a powerful, it's a powerful message to the people that walk in there. 
So love God, love your neighbor. In other words, blessed are those who are merciful now to their neighbor. They, they will receive mercy of eternal life in the future. So when Jesus talks about pure in heart, well, the heart is what you are. And Jesus talks a lot about the heart during his teachings. He talks about how important it is. It's the invisible root in ourselves. And it matters to God what is at the invisible branch. root of ourselves because to outside people. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So from the heart come all of the issues of our life. Matthew 15 says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And earlier on in Matthew, he talks about out of a good tree you can get good fruit, a bad tree you get bad fruit, but you can't get good, good fruit from a bad tree. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So the heart is particularly crucial to Jesus. What we are in our deep, private recesses of our own lives is what we care about the most. What is in our heart is what we care about the most. Jesus didn't come into the world simply because we have some bad habits that we need to break. He came into the world because we have such impure hearts that we need to be purified through his Holy Spirit. So what are the peacemakers? Why does Jesus care about peacemakers? He says they'll be called the children of God. But when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers that he called the children of God, he isn't talking about how to become a son of God. Rather, he's talking about how the sons of God, the children of God, are in fact peacemakers. So if we are children of God, then we are peacemakers. People who are peacemakers are recognized as sons of God in judgment. And they'll be welcome into the Father's house. We know that the scripture, uh, from Scripture that the Heavenly Father is a God of peace. Romans 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, Hebrews 13. So God is a God of peace. Heaven is a world of peace. Luke 19, 38, we see that. And most important of all, that God is a peacemaker. God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them. 2 Corinthians 5. Colossians 1 says, He made peace by the blood of the cross. The ultimate he made peace through the blood of the cross. So even though by nature we rebel against God and we've committed high treason against him, eternally we deserve to be court-martialed. But nevertheless, God sacrificed his son and now declares an amnesty. We're free and clear of any of this if we lay down our own independence and give our lives to Christ and come home to the faith that Jesus asks us to have. God is a peace-loving God a peacemaking God. And the whole history of redemption climaxing in the death of his son is God's strategy to bring about just and lasting peace between the rebel, which is us, and God, but also us and our fellow man. Love God, love our neighbor. So it's twofold. He doesn't just want us to love him. You can know his children by whether they're willing to make sacrifices for peace the way God made a sacrifice for peace. And now the last one, we look at the persecuted, and this is an interesting one. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, those who are, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And when you look at persecution on a global scale, there was an article in Christianity Today that said, worst year ever. I read that, and my initial thought was, I, I'm not sure the people of the early church would agree with that. This is the worst year ever for Christian persecution. And if you look at the first, first second centuries, things were pretty rough back then for these people. But when I read more into it, it states that the last 25 years, which is really when they started tracking this particular type of persecution around the globe, the last three years have been consecutively worse. So it was bad three years ago, and then the next year was worse, and the next year was worse again. So it's, it's relative to the last 25 years. Each year keeps getting topped up to 2017. The article says that about 215 million Christians experience high, very high, or extreme persecution across the globe. 
North Korea remains one of the most dangerous places to be as a Christian and has been for the last 14 years straight. Islamic extremism remains a global dominant driver of persecution responsible for initiating oppression and conflict in 35 out of the top 50 countries uh, on the 2017 list. In the US, it's a growing trend to persecute Christians for their beliefs, especially among the minority groups claiming to be persecuted by Christians. Christians have become an easy target in the West. And the majority of the persecution in the West is just through words. But Jesus does include this in all persecution. Insult you, he said. Say evil against you. But in other parts of the world, it's worse. Prison, torture, and even death. So in the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 3, it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Paul makes this statement on the basis of a deep conviction about Christianity and the nature of the sinfulness of man. He knows the sinfulness of man and what effect that will have. He is convinced that there is a real tension between the way that Christians live and the mindset and the way of the rest of the world. So conflict is inevitable. This conviction that Paul has is rooted in the fact that fallen man and the nature, in the, in the nature of fallen man and in the new creation that, that is Christ. It doesn't go out of date. It's still true today. Sooner or later, a, deep, a deeply God-centered Christian will be mistreated for what he believes or how he lives. So these words of Jesus about persecution are just as relevant today as they have ever been. But not because of the millions of Christians around the world that are being persecuted for their faith, but also because, to one degree or another, all of us who are completely serious about putting God first in our work, in our home, in our schools, in our leisure time, will come across some form of opposition sooner or later. None of us knows when our freedom to be Christian may stop or when we may be called to God to go to a dangerous place or to take a stand that will cause many other people to dislike us even more. But when this persecution does come, Jesus illustrates where does this persecution come from? Well, Jesus uses an illustration in Luke 16. He says that no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And he uses money as an example in this. But here comes the persecution side of this. Verse 14 says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they scoffed at him. It doesn't sound very powerful, scoffed, but I'm sure it's a lot worse than that. I mean, these are Pharisees. People listen to these people. They were the leaders and the influencers of the time. So if Jesus is not pleasing them, it's a serious problem. So there's a persecution, and the part of the explanation is that they were lovers of money. In other words, Jesus' attitudes towards money or the lack of, or the attack on the love of money, he says to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves before men. So this is the root. It's twofold. The first thing is to have a love of something that is not Christ. The second is to justify it before other men, to justify it before other people. You can love something other than God, but then if you justify it to other, before other people, then it's persecution against those that do love God. And this is the foundation of kingdom culture. So the Beatitudes, a good start to what is Christian value system, the playbook of Christian living, striving to be like Christ. It's a great introduction to three chapters of Christian living instructions, and it's very clear when you look at the weaknesses that aren't so much weaknesses. So Jesus was turning things around. God sees us for who we are. We've got to remember this. This is not man looking at us. This is God seeing us for who we are. And it's his chisel that he picks up and he shapes us in the image of Christ. And when he does that, he takes into account all the flaws, all the weaknesses that we have, as well as all the strengths in our personalities. And he uses us for kingdom work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please give us the wisdom to see what you want from us. Give us the insight 
through the words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount to be able to live life according to your will, to be able to find purpose that is driven through Christ's expression and to find ourselves molded as closely to the version of Christ that we can get. We know our faults. We know our weaknesses deep down, even if we never admit them to anyone else. You know our weaknesses deep down. So Lord, please help us to capitalize on our weaknesses to become strength. Lord, help us to understand to love you first. To love our neighbors second. For no other reason is what you've told us to do in so many different ways phrase in different words in the Bible but Jesus tells it as clear as day to help us to understand and listen to what he has to say to us Lord as we go out this week we just pray for guidance we pray for the Holy Spirit to work in our heart and we pray this in the name of your son Jesus Christ Amen have a great day thank you